here we go. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. Um, we're very pleased to have Wayne and Karen Brown with us today. Um, you may have seen them a couple months ago when they joined us for our program about Antarctica. Um, they actually live in California um, and they usually visit our library in the spring when they do kind of a tour of Illinois and visit lots of schools and libraries. But using Zoom, it just works out. They can be anywhere and we're so happy to have them back. Um, Wayne and Karen are really fascinating people. They are a husband and wife underwater explorer team. Um, they have many talents such as marine biologists, naturalists, expedition leaders, pilot, actor, artists, authors, storytellers, educators, scuba diving instructors, and underwater photographers. They have so many skills, it's amazing. So, um, well, Wayne and Karen, thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to have you back. Great, thanks, great to be back. I just have a, I'm curious about how many people joined us for Antarctic program. Just raise your hand, we'll be able to see you. Okay, see so a lot of people have, have seen us already. So see them. we're following up on that. As if you were there in our previous program, Antarctica, we talked about our job, which we're doing today. In Antarctica, we talked mainly about behind the scenes, what we do as we're working on these ships. We work on expedition ships, for those of you that weren't with us before. I'm a marine biologist, my wife's a marine conservationist and a whale watcher. And uh, we travel around the world on small expedition ships. I hold it. is the skull of an adult male polar bear. Males are a little bigger than females. And check out these jaws. I mean, incredible. Um, but the most important thing about this bear is that big thing in front, the big hole in front. That's the nose. The polar bear has an incredible sense of smell. The polar bear has such an incredible smell. It can smell better than the, the best bloodhound. Um, we call a polar bear a nose with four legs. If you think about it, it's an ideal adaptation to where they live. They live in the Arctic. They live in the, in the uh, they travel across the ice in the Arctic Ocean. Sometimes in the wintertime, it may be dark all the time, like 24 hours a day. When we're there in the summertime, it's like 24 hours a day. But in the wintertime, if it's dark, there's a blizzard, the camp polar bear can't see very far, no problem because they smell where they're going. They're actually like a nose with four legs. So we're gonna take you to visit polar bears today. But first, let me show you another cool thing about polar bears. Check this out. It's bigger than my head. This is the paw of a polar bear. Of course, it's not real, but we made one so it looks like a real paw. These are huge. And that's another important adaptation for polar bears. Because think about it when they're walking on the ice in the snow. If you ever go outside in the wintertime, walk in the snow, it's too deep. You sink down uh, to your waist or deeper. You need to wear snowshoes to walk on top of the snow. These huge polar bear paws are like polar bear snowshoes. Helps the polar bears walk on top of the ice and snow without breaking through. Another cool thing about these paws is that polar bears, I'm a marine biologist, and the reason I'm interested as a marine mammal because they spend about 70% of their life in the water. If you're going to be in the water, how do you move quickly? You put on fins. These are like polar bear flippers. It helps the polar bear swim very quickly. The polar bear bat dog paddles like a dog. They trail their rear paws for steering. So these big paws work like fins for helping them swim really quickly in the water. Another thing, look at these big sharp claws like a knife and fork. It helps the polar bear hold its Food. If we're walking on the ice, crawling up in the ice, you'll see the polar bear today as we show our images, uh, crawling up in the ice. You wouldn't be able to do that unless you dug in the ice, and that's how they can do it with their sharp claws. We work in the Arctic in the summertime when it's light 24 hours a day. In the wintertime, well, usually the end of the summer, as the sun starts uh, diminishing as far as the number of hours that are light during the day, that's when the polar bear moms start to look for a place to make a den to have their babies. Usually they den, they dig their den around October, have their babies around November. And when the babies are born, they're about the size of a white rat. Look at how small that little, little baby is. These babies will grow very quickly. In about three months, around March, then the mothers will take their cubs, of which there are two. She'll take her cubs out of the den and never to return. When their cubs are ready to leave their den, they've gone from this size very quickly to this size right here. Look at how big that polar bear is. 
that's a baby polar bear just coming out of his den, ready to go hunting. The moms will take care of their cubs about three years. They teach the cubs how to hunt and where to find their food, how to dig dens, how to navigate. After that, then the mom will leave the cubs on their own and the polar bears uh, will fend for themselves. So we're gonna take you to the Arctic, to a special place to look for polar bears. Now, there's a place you may have heard of in Canada called Churchill. It's a place you can actually get in these big buggies, tundra buggies they call them, and go roam the areas looking for polar bears. Polar bears are ice loving bears. I don't really, um, I'm not really interested in going to a place like that because that's not really the natural habitat of the polar bears. It's kind of a, they're not doing their natural behaviors and usually around towns. We like to go out in the ice and see the polar bears in their natural habitat. Okay, so now we're gonna take you to a special place. We're in North America, and of course you guys are over near the Great Lakes. We're on the other side of the US. We're gonna take you up to the top of the planet. And that is where we find the Arctic Ocean. Now, in this view, it looks like a nice blue ocean, but actually that's not the case. The Arctic Ocean is covered in ice. In the wintertime, it extends quite a long distance. In the summertime, that contracts. Now, in the middle of the Arctic Ocean is a place, of course, known as the North Pole. And the North Pole is actually very unusual in that the North Pole is actually on water because ice is water. So the North Pole is on water, which is surrounded by land. Last time when we went to Antarctica, we went to the South, we talked about the South Pole. In Antarctica, the South Pole is on land surrounded by water. Now, around this Arctic Ocean is a special uh, circle and it's called the Arctic Circle. The word Arctic actually means bears. So you will find bears in the Arctic. But remember when we talked about Antarctica last time, the word Antarctic means without or no bears. So no bears in the southern, no polar bears in the southern hemisphere down by the South Pole, only in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic. Now around the Arctic Circle, polar bears live all around these areas like around Asia, North America, Greenland, uh, Europe, but there are 19 populations of polar bears and each population group responds differently to changes in their environment. Uh, I saw an article yesterday by BBC about losing polar bears by 2100. Actually, if you dug into the article, you found out actually that's not true. There are still populations which will survive even in the most dire predictions. So polar bears as a whole are not gonna become extinct in our lifetimes, even though different population groups can be impacted. But let's check out what's going on right now. We're gonna take you to this area called Svalbard. Just below it is the place, of course, Norway. We're familiar with that. Um, Svalbard is actually owned or controlled by Norway. And it's the most northerly place that anyone lives to the North Pole. If you're going to do an expedition to the North Pole, you would leave from a little town in Svalbard. As Svalbard is an archipelago of five islands. And that is the best place in the world to look for polar bears in their natural habitat. So we're gonna take you there today. We're gonna to start at our home in Los Angeles, California. And let's see where we're going. That's what it looks like in the summertime when the ice is melted. We're gonna take you there in the summertime, starting from Los Angeles, flying across North America, across the North Atlantic until we reach the island group called Svalbard. Actually, you would, would travel there through Norway, connecting on a smaller flight to get you in there. But this is the island group. Now, as you travel to Svalbard, you'll be surprised that on the west coast of Svalbard, where we join, it's not usually uh, surrounded by ice, even in the wintertime. This arrow you see coming up uh, through the North Atlantic is the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream kind of ends right near Svalbard. And as a result, the west coast of these islands are pretty much ice free all year round. And it's a good place to go uh, and start our voyage. We're gonna be on a ship to look for polar bears. One thing I should point out too that's going on here, in the summertime, the ice is receding as you saw in the, in the earlier picture. And as a result, the sunlight penetrates the ocean. In the wintertime, when the sun never shines, it's very dark, not a lot of productivity in the ocean, but in the summertime, the sun's always shining, the ice is gone, you have lots of nutrients in the area, and that produces an abundance of food. So as a result, you have animals migrating here from 
the northern hemisphere to feed in the summertime, like whales and birds. We're going to be seeing some of those in our expedition today. So let's take a closer look at Svalbard. As we zoom in, we're looking at now the only city on the island. About 2,500 people live here called Longyearbyen, right on the edge of the fjord. On the top left of the photo, you see the International Airport, and then you can see this connects to the town of Longyearbyen. Longyearbyen is um, actually a popular tourist destination all year round. You go in the wintertime and, and go snowmobiling across the ice and snow. You can look at the northern lights. Um, it's an incredible place, but we go in the summertime when it's light all the time and it's warmest. Even though it's still cold, it's a lot warmer than you would have going there in the wintertime. Now, a couple places I want to point out. Uh, one place you see is called the Global Seed Bank. The other place is a shooting range, and I'll talk about those in more detail. There's the airport, there's the Global Seed Bank and the shooting range. Let me first talk about this place called the Global Seed Bank. Right there on the side of the hill, jutting out, it's actually a long tunnel that goes under the ground. Because it's cold here, the temperature is a constant uh, temperature that is good for storing things like seeds. So this is the Global Seed Bank, and uh, you have countries from around the world that have actually taken their seeds here to store them. If there's any sort of ecological disaster in the countries where their crops are wiped out, they still have access to the seeds and start all over again. So this is the Global Seed Bank used in case of any sort of major tragedy. This plays into uh, what we do there. We go to the shooting range before we board the ship, and at the base of this little uh, uh, cliff here on this plateau, that's where the shooting range is. And what's going on here? Well, as part of the expedition team, we do need to know how to use a rifle in case of an emergency. So that picture was me um, with uh, taking a lesson from the man who's in charge of the rifles. He's my instructor and he taught us all how to use the rifle. Not that we would ever use it, hopefully not, but we need to be aware of it and, and know how. Now that's important because polar bears can kill you. We've been diving with great white sharks and moray eels and all sorts of animals in the ocean people are scared of. Uh, they're not as scary as polar bears. Polar bears in the Arctic, there's not a lot of food around and they're looking for food. And to them, you could be food. So if necessary, we have to have a rifle to protect ourselves from uh, charging polar bears. We've never had to use our rifles. Uh, we take precautions, as I mentioned during the program, how we avoid that. But that is a last resort, in fact, here in Longyearbyen, if you leave the city limits, they require you to take a rifle with you. And because every few years, somebody gets killed by a polar bear, so they are dangerous. So this is the city of Longyearbyen you're looking at on the edge of the water. Looking from above, I'm actually in the remains of a coal mine here looking down to the town. It's not a very big town, as you see here, uh, mostly along the waterfront. Uh, in the middle of the town is the kind of the promenade, kind of like a ski town where you have shops and restaurants. Uh, right near the water's edge, this long row of brown buildings is the Norwegian Polar Institute, and plus they have a very nice museum there as well. And that's where we start our trip from, this town of Longyearbyen. You can see the history here. The history was the town uh, being formed by coal miners, actually a gentleman in New York called the Longyear set up this town. They named it after him, and he was a mining engineer. So they set up a coal mining, which actually still goes to, on today. And they have a very high grade coal here, which is mined. I think there's only one or two mines remaining, but it still goes on today. And that's the major job for people here in this town. You can see on the side of the hill some uh, old mining ruins and some tailings, that red marking on the side of the cliff. As you look at the outskirts of town, they have a monument to the miners that have died in various accidents in the mines. The statue in the main promenade here, one of the miners representing the mining that goes on here throughout the year. Look at these colorful buildings. Now in, in Svalbard, this whole archipelago, there's not a lot of color. It's mainly rock and ice and snow. So look at these colorful buildings. If you want to move there, uh, you can. Actually, Svalbard was was uninhabited until it was discovered in 
1589 by a, a Dutch navigator named Willem Barents. And um, so, so there was competition between who would control it, mainly Russia and Norway. Well, it was decided that Norway would have administrative control, but all the countries that signed the treaty were allowed to come in here. And Russia was one of those uh, treaty signers. So if you want to move there, uh, you can do that without having to worry about uh, uh, a permit, a work permit. And so it's, imposs it's possible to go there and, and, and actually retire or live. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to retire there, but you could actually set up a business there. Now, if you want to build a house or you want to have a house, you don't build a house, the house is already there. Uh, the governor of the uh, town, appointed by the Queen of Norway, he tells you what color you can paint your house. So these are all certain colors that are uh, designated by the uh, administration. Notice all these snowmobiles here. Not a lot of roads, not very far you can drive here. And uh, you, if you want to get around, use snowmobiles, especially in the wintertime when everything's covered in snow. So even though not everybody has cars here in Longyearbyen, everybody does have a snowmobile. This is a wild area. Besides polar bears living here, you have this animal like we see in front of us. That is a Svalbard reindeer. They're a little smaller than regular reindeer. These reindeer you see here get up to about five feet long, weighing up to between 143 pounds for the males to 120 pounds for the, the females. They live about 10 years, so not a long lifespan. You see this one shedding its winter coat of, of white fur roaming around. In the summertime, they're very busy because in the wintertime, a lot of, of the plants are either dead or they're covered in ice and snow. So it's hard to find food. So in the summertime, these reindeer are bit very busy just bulking up. During the summertime, they may gain anywhere from 50 to 60 pounds uh, just to uh, get ready for the, those long winters. This reindeer is now losing its, its winter coat, getting that kind of the the gray-brown color of its uh, summer coat. Notice the antlers. One thing I should point out, both male and female reindeer have antlers, but the males lose their antlers in the wintertime. So if you think about this, wintertime, that's when Santa has his sleigh being pulled by reindeer. Well, notice the reindeer on Santa's sleigh all have antlers. That means the reindeer Santa's using are all females. Even Rudolph is a female. So you can tell your friends that uh, about that, something most people don't really realize. But that's uh, what you find here, roaming the area, chomping down, eating as much as they can, bulking up for uh, the approaching winter. Here we are in the center of town. People here love polar bears. You can see by this big polar bear statue. But as I mentioned, polar bears can be dangerous. So when you leave the outskirts of town, there are warning signs warning about the danger of polar bears. But we're not going to worry about polar bear danger because we're going to be not on land, but on the ship. Yes, this ship on this particular expedition was on the ship called the Expedition. Um, a great place to, a great platform to ex explore the area. Expedition's a good name for the ship because we're really going on an expedition. Yeah, we're part of the staff on board. We'll be driving Zodiacs, inflatable boats to go do landings and, and go land on the ice and land. And also uh, we have about 120 people here that that join us. So this will be our home. We're usually on the on board the ship. We've been on the ship anywhere from two months to three months at a time in the summertime. And the trips here last anywhere from a week to maybe two weeks. So we're going to take you first to this, you see this orange uh, name at the top called Pyramiden. That is considered by National Geographic one of the top 10 ghost towns on the planet. It's an old Russian coal mine and it was abandoned back in 1991 when the Iron Curtain fell, when the Russian Soviet Union disintegrated. They had no money to fund it, so that, that was the end of it. Um, but because Russia still needs a foothold in the area, they have another coal mine. And this coal mine, uh, if you look near the bottom of the image, that one is called Barentsburg. I think I have it here. Yeah, Barentsburg. And that's an actual working coal mine even today. So the Russians want to maintain a foothold there, especially during the Cold War. They had probably things hidden, doing covert operations there. But we're going to take a visit to Pyramid, and that's a really cool place, as you'll see in just a minute. As we leave Longyearbyen, we travel up the fjord. You see everything's covered in ice and snow. The glaciers flow into the water, and we're checking those out a little bit later on our expedition. Here's a Svalbard reindeer. Hasn't lost its winter coat yet. 
moving out of the area because it's being followed at a distance by this. See it right on the beach, right there, the polar bear. Now polar bears feed mainly on marine mammals like seals, uh, but they also are opportunist feeders in that if anything's available and they're hung hungry, they may try to get it like birds or even reindeer. So the reindeer doesn't want to hang out with the polar bears nearby. So welcome to Pyramiden. And uh, if you look up the mountain to the, just the right of the sign, you see some black on the side of the mountain, that's the coal mine. If you wanna go underground, you have to go up to go underground because that's where the mine is. And here I am on shore with uh, the Russian, a Russian host. Uh, we have our rifles with us because you just saw polar bears are in the area. Uh, but I should point out, if you see a polar bear, we do not try to shoot it. We try to move out of the area. We want to protect the polar bear and ourselves. Our first line of defense is around my neck, hanging in front there, binoculars. We look around the area, scout the area, making sure there are no polar bears nearby. If, they're not, if there are polar bears nearby, we will not do a landing. During our landing, we actually have scouts in the area. So we're scouting the area. You can see a polar bear coming toward us. We'll leave the area. So we actually avoid. I've never had to shoot a polar bear. not planning on it. But... That's uh, one of the ways we protect ourselves, by scanning the area. If a polar bear does approach us, we have another way, non-lethal way, to uh, avoid any confrontation. I'm also wearing a flare pistol. I can shoot that into the air. It makes a loud sound, a bright light, and that would usually scare away a polar bear. So that's what we're carrying with us here on shore as we explore the area. We're there just above the ledge, and you see this pier sticking out. That's where we have the picture taken. We're going to take you to the town. And back during the time of the Cold War, before the Soviet Union fell, this was the model Russian city. Uh, this people that lived here lived a high lifestyle that they would only dream of on the mainland. As we approach the town, you see these buildings here, apartment buildings where people lived. And that long line going up the side of the hill is the trailway that took miners up to the mine and coal down to the port. So that's the town square, the main mall. And that big sign there says Arctic Coal Spitsbergen, 79 degrees north latitude. So you're way above the Arctic Circle. At the end of the mall there, you see the cultural center. Uh, they had their, you, we can actually go inside the buildings. There's basketball court in there. They have a theater for, for performances and movies, ballet, you have ballet uh, lessons there, ballet classes, music classes, art classes, there's a library there. And right across from it, there is an indoor pool. So uh, you live very well here in uh, Pyramid. And there's a look, Lenin, the statue of Lenin there looks out over the town. You can, beautiful view of the fjord and the mountains and glaciers in the background. So now let's leave Pyramid and head out to sea. We're gonna take you out and down a little bit to a place called Inga Brixton Bukta. Bukta means bay, and Inga Brixton was a Norwegian whaler that is named after. As you travel down the coast of Spitsbergen, Spitsbergen was named by Willem Barents, and the name Dutch means pointy mountains. And you can see all the pointy mountains, which is very appropriate to be named that. And we're traveling down, you see the ice, the glaciers that, that flow down to the sea between the mountains. Now, as we get to Engelbrigsten Bukta, this is really fascinating because I'm not a geologist, but if you, if you uh, even are not a geologist, this is spectacular scenery. Uh, these layers of rocks that have been upthrust from the sea floor are just spectacular. There's no plants or trees to block the view, so they have spectacular views of the geology in the area here. And it's just amazing just to go here and just on a clear day, this is what it looks like. Now we're going here, not only because of the geology, but because of what we find here. Notice this very narrow entrance to the fjord. Well, this was used by Norwegian whalers. They, would take a, they could take a rowboat and row across this little opening here with a net and block the opening because they were hunting beluga whales. Beluga whales, the white whales, you've seen them probably at Shedd Aquarium. Um, they are not a big whale, and uh, they come in in the summertime for a couple reasons. 
Blue whales shed their skin every summertime. You mean belugas. Beluga whales, what do you say? You blue. Blue. Beluga whales shed their skin every summertime, and to help them get rid of that dead skin, they like to scratch themselves in the rocks in the bottom in shallow water. There are lots of rocks here in the shallow area, so the belugas would come here to shed their dead skin. Also to catch food, a good place to find food like crabs and fish. So this is a popular place for belugas to come. The trouble is though, when they came here, they were slaughtered by the whalers. And those are some of the bones remaining of the belugas that were slaughtered here. Fortunately, they did not become extinct. They're making a comeback. We see them all across the Arctic. Even today, you'll find belugas here in the bay, in the fjord, like in the distance. See this right here? Beluga whales, beluga whales like orcas or killer whales live in family groups. So you always see them in a group. Here's a group of three belugas here. Sometimes they can be curious as they swim through the area. Here they come. Now, when the belugas are born, they're not born white. They're actually born kind of a light gray. And every year they shed their skin and their skin becomes whiter and whiter. So finally the babies become totally white, just like their parents. For a beluga whale, you're looking at up to about 15 feet long. Females are slightly smaller and they weigh about, oh, almost over one and a half tons. So uh, not a big whale, but uh, a good size whale. When the young are born, they're around four and a half feet long, weighing about uh, 130 pounds. Now here comes a young beluga coming up to see us, spouting right next to us, making its blow. Sometimes they can be quite curious, as you see here, checking us out. That big bulge in the top of its head there, that's actually a sack of oil, which it can use to pinpoint sound. When it makes sound, it can actually use that, it can reconfigure that, that bulb of oil to actually uh, pinpoint the sound of what it's trying to, to catch. It can stun the animals they're trying to catch with the loud sounds. They have very sharp teeth, as you see here, for catching their prey, which consists, I mentioned, of fish and crabs. And here is a, a behavior uh, may often use to see what's going on called spy hopping. They pop out of the water and look around and see what's going on. So after checking us out, this young beluga goes back to, to its family. But we're going to continue on now. We're going to leave from Ingelbrigsten Bukta. We're going up toward the north, heading up toward the ice. But first, we're going to stop here. Now here's what's going on. I mentioned earlier in their program, that we have the Gulf Stream coming up here. As the Gulf Stream comes up, there are some things going on. Firstly, in the summertime, as snow and ice starts to melt, there's an outflow of nutrients that come from the land out to the sea. And also, simultaneously, there's an upwelling. It's like an upside down waterfall. There are a lot of nutrients trapped in the deep water sediments and deep water areas. When you have upwellings, it's a flow of water going up and this brings nutrients up toward the surface. That produces lots and lots of marine growth. In the summertime, when the sun is shining all the time, there's no ice blocking it. It's an abundance of food. First the plankton and other animals feeding on the plankton. And as a result, you'll have lots of animals coming here to feed. In this picture's area in particular, this is a good area. We've always seen whales. And as you look around heading up the coast, you may see something like this, right near a ship. That blow coming out of the water is from the whale, but not just any whale. That whale, we can tell by its mottling color of its skin, is a blue whale, the biggest animal on the planet. In fact, the biggest animal that's ever lived. Now, there are different populations of blue whales. Uh, the northern population in the North Atlantic don't get quite as big as the southern population. In the northern populations, the blue whales get to be up to about 86 feet long. In the southern populations down by Antarctica, they get to be sometimes over 100 feet long. Incredible animals uh, weighing over 100 tons. They're, they're huge animals. Uh, their calves are about 23 feet long, weighing about three tons. And when the calves are born, they grow very quickly with their mother's rich milk. They gain up to 200 pounds a day. Right now, we believe they're probably in the world population about 10 to 25,000 blue whales, of which in this area here in the North Atlantic, we have anywhere from one to 2,000 blue whales. And there it is. Now, one of the ways we can definitely identify whether it's a blue whale is uh, its skin coloration. See, it's kind of mottled. It's kind of a, a blue gray, kind of like gunmetal gray. Another thing is look at the back of the whale. It takes a while because it's so long. As you watch, look at the back of the whale. 
Look at this little tiny fin. That's a dorsal fin, very tiny. Uh, even though it's the largest whale on the planet, it has one of the smallest dorsal fins of, of the whales that have dorsal fins. That's about less than 12 inches uh, high, and that's the tiny fin of a blue whale. So we can tell that's definitely a blue whale. We're continuing on our journey up toward the north part of the island. We're stopping at a small island called Amsterdam Oya. And Oya is a Norwegian word for island. So this is Amsterdam Island. And of course, as you would expect, it was named by the Dutch. The Dutch came here besides discovering it first, they were first to exploit its resources. The resources here were whales. There are thousands and thousands of whales here. In fact, sometimes there were reports where people said you could actually walk across the fjords on the backs of the whales. There's so many whales here. Well, back in the uh, 15, 16, 1700s, even getting in the 1800s, whale oil was kind of like what we consider petroleum oil today. It was used by a lot of uh, things. It was used in a lot of ways, making products. It was used for lighting uh, uh, whale oil lamps around the world, also for lubrication. So it was very valuable like petroleum oil is today. So as a result, the Dutch came here to harvest the whales. And as we get up to this area called Amsterdam Oya, here it is, we're on shore now. Notice in front of us, you see a little red area there in the picture and kind of a mound of sand that was made by the Dutch whalers. And this was actually an oven, which was an open pot basically, where they boiled the oil. They would take the whale blubber, they strip the blubber, which is the fat of the whale. They stick it in these pots and boil the oil out. And that's how they extracted the oil. And this is what it looks like in the summertime. They only came here in the summertime. About 200 people came here to harvest the whales. You see in the picture, the whale being stripped of its blubber and then the pots being used by people uh, to uh, boil the, the uh, oil out of the blubber. And this was a very, very big industry. In one trip, you could make more in one trip than you could in a lifetime if you were a sailor. Of course, the problem is if you came here, there's no, uh, you may not ever come back. So uh, because it's very dangerous and people here didn't swim, you go on the water, you can only survive probably about 10 minutes. Well, when the whalers came here, they usually brought planks of wood with them so they could have a coffin made for them so they could be buried in the coffin. And those coffins actually still exist. You can actually see them on land today because there's no forces that would erode those. So many whalers did die here, but those that survived did quite well. As we go on shore here, we're anchored. Look around the point, you see some people standing there and they're looking at something here. Those animals, and let's check them out. Yep, they're walrus. Incredible animals, huge animals. Walrus get to be sometimes up to like 18 feet long. And these animals can weigh up to, oh, one ton. And their skin is totally thick. The skin can get as thick as like up to six inches thick. Um, in Alaska, they use the walrus skin for making boats out of and use it for the whole of the, uh, use it for the whole of the boat because it's such incredibly thick, tough skin. They're laying out here, these are males. They gather together when they're mating and they sexually segregate after mating. So the males are here on the west end of Svalbard. The females are usually on the northern and, and east end of Svalbard. And these are just males hanging out here on the beach. Let's check them out more closely. Wow, blubber slugs. <laughs> they're just laying here. Uh, in the water, of course, they're, they're uh, uh, very weightless because of the blubber, but on land, uh, it's hard to move around. They slide around their bellies. They all have tusks, both males and females. Only the male tusks are longer than the female tusks. Here's one kind of coming out of the water. Notice the, the red dots in its skin. Um, those dots are actually because the whale's overheated. They have so much blubber and such thick skin. The problem is for the walrus, not getting cold, getting too hot. So this walrus is really hot. So it, the blood flows to the outer part of its skin. That's what you see here. The blood just under its skin as it tries to cool down. The walrus lay together here and uh, conserve body heat in the cold and the wind. Notice the walrus here on the far right has short tusks. He's a young one. So these are older and younger males together. Look at these three walrus here, but notice the one on the far right. There's something stuck in his tusk. That was put there by one of the researchers that live here in one of the research stations. And that's a depth recorder. They can actually use that device for recording depths where the, to determine how deep they dive, but also they can use it as a remote sensing station. Other sensors on it can detect the salinity of the ocean. It can 
detect, uh, it can give you directions as far as GPS readings. So it actually, the walrus act as remote sensing platforms and allow uh, ocean uh, research to be done as well. In the snow nearby, we see some polar bear tracks. You think these big slugs here, not able to move around too well on land would be prime targets for polar bears. That's not true because their skin is so thick, it's hard for the polar bears to use their claws and get through the skin. And also think about those long tusks. Those long tusks are weapons for the, for the walrus and they can very easily gouge a polar bear. The only polar bears that would try to attack a walrus is if the polar bear is desperate. If it's very hungry, no other source of food, it may try to attack a walrus and that usually ends badly for the polar bear. And we found that happening right here. On the other side of the bay, laying in the rocks, you see a polar bear there? Look at its backside right there. That spot, that's a gouge from a polar bear tusk. That polar bear is very skinny. You can actually see its ribs sticking out here. And unfortunately, because of that, that polar bear will probably not last to the end of the season. It will starve to death. And that's how polar bears die. They die as they get older. They, it's harder for them to catch their food. Their teeth wear down. And as a result, they actually die from starvation. So that's what happens to polar bears as they get older. In the wild, polar bears live about 35 years in captivity because they're well cared for, don't have to worry about trying to catch their food. They live up to 50 years in captivity. Now, we're talking about the glaciers we see here. Let's take a closer look at some of these glaciers. These glaciers are formed miles back by the snow. As the snow gets deeper and deeper, it doesn't melt, and it, the snow on top crushes the lower layers into ice. That large chunk of ice starts moving downhill. It may take 100 years for it to move from where it started down to the ocean before it falls into the ocean. As you see us here and one of our zodiacs, you see how big it is. Sometimes these can get to be as big as like an eight-story building. That is one of the reasons we don't want to take you too close to that because imagine having eight-story building fall on top of you. That's what, what can happen as a polar bear breaks off called calving. As you cruise across the front of the glacier, we hear loud sounds like thunder and that's the ice cracking. And uh, we know in the summertime, we'll probably see some ice cracking and falling in. That's another reason we don't wanna to go too close to the glacier because when that ice falls in, it makes big waves and those waves could knock us in the water. Another thing that was discovered, unfortunately, several years ago, um, when the ice hits a rock, that shatters it and that can, that can scatter the ice for quite a long distance. About maybe four or five years ago, there was a woman killed when uh, a glacier calved, it hit some rocks, and even though this woman was a half mile away, the ice shot across and actually hit her in the head and she died. So we're trying to keep a good distance away and uh, avoid any problems with glaciers, but they are incredibly beautiful. Notice <laughs> the ice that's fallen off the glacier makes little islands and some animals take advantage of this, like this animal we see right there. The biggest of all the Arctic seals called the bearded seal. They can get to be, oh, over eight feet long. Now bearded seals have uh, lots of blubber. They're one of the favorite foods of polar bears. And they're on the ice hoping that uh, they'll see any polar bears approaching them so they can dive into the water and get away. This seal, the bearded seal gets its name because look at those whiskers. Those whiskers kind of look like a beard. That's why they call this seal a bearded seal. They're also called a square flipper seal. Look at the flipper kind of squared off. Uh, that's the flipper of the beard seal. They have claws. The claws are for helping them climb up in the ice. And that's where they spend a lot of time napping on the ice. This is an Arctic tern. Arctic terns have the longest migration of any bird. Arctic terns are live, spend their summers in the Arctic and our winter, but the summer in Antarctica. So they will fly all the way from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back every year. And Arctic terns you see here are fish feeders. They actually don't have waterproof wings like cormorants do. They can't dive underwater. They just uh, dive at the surface. And at the surface pick up things like, like little fish and squid that may be there. And that's what they feed on. This is a type of gull. It's called a kitty wake. Why do they call them kitty wakes? Because of what they say. They say, kitty wake, kitty wake. <laughs> yes, they're all- Now I should say, this oh. is a type of gull, but if you are not a birder, you may not realize it. There are no seagulls, there are only gulls. There are bagels, but we only have those for breakfast. Mm, okay. <laughs> 
Lots of kitty wake, kitty wakes. Um, we see them on land and, and, and out on the ice. They like to rest on the ice like this one's doing right here. And they're a medium sized bird growing up to 16 inches long and have a wingspan up to about uh, uh, over three feet wide. Incredible. They live about uh, 20 years. So you'll see them all over probably the most commonly seen bird we see here in the Svalbard area. We all see them in Alaska too. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they gather right near the edge of the glacier, which seems like kind of a dumb place to be because they could be injured by or even killed by ice falling in. But they're doing that because when the ice falls in, it stirs up the water and brings nutrients and food to the surface. And like this happening here, a big chunk of ice falling in. And of course, when the, if it's near the, the kitty wakes, they'll take off as they are here. And they're surrounding us right here. Thousands of kitty wakes flying all around us and around the glacier. And now you see the, the water's go, uh, vacant of all the kitty wakes. Here's another bird that we find. It's, this is called an Atlantic puffin. And Atlantic puffins, you'll see them near the shore. They eat fish. Uh, they, they can swim probably better than they can fly. Yeah, that's really funny when they fly. It looks like they're flapping wings as fast as they can to stay up. So they're not very graceful, kind of comical above water, but underwater, they're very graceful. So they're better swimmers than they are flyers. Their wingspan is about uh, um, oh, a couple feet wide. They're only, the, the bird when it's standing is only about eight feet tall, not eight feet, I mean, eight inches tall. Yeah, as 10 you to see 11 here. inches. There we go. Yeah, okay. yeah. You see a male and female here. They mate for life and they lay one egg right on the rocks there. At the end of the summer, they fly south, usually not too far south, like the British Isles. And the next summer, they come back and do it all over again. And they come here because of the abundance of food, right. like the other birds do. Okay, now we're going to go up toward the ice. We're going to travel along the northern part of Svalbard. But we're looking at our ice charts. And this is something that the Norwegian Meteorological Institute produces every day, so we can actually check these, because they change day by day. The ice sheet in the Arctic Ocean, especially in the summertime, is not one solid sheet of ice. It's actually like jigsaw puzzle pieces that are moving around. And with the wind and currents, they may shift. Sometimes an area we look like we could go through is totally blocked by the ice. Our ship is designed to go into the ice, but cannot penetrate ice deeper, uh, thicker than about three feet thick. So we have to make sure we don't go into ice, we could get trapped. The red area there is the densest and thickest ice, and the different colors represent ice that's less close together and less thick. So we're looking at areas that are like green and yellow and gray. The red we can get into, but we have to go into it carefully, make sure that we have press passage in and passage out. That's what it looks like right now as far as where the ice is. We're gonna to travel up to right on the edge of the ice, these islands. And these islands, I'm not gonna pronounce that. My Norwegian's not that good. <laughs> it means seven islands. It's a group of seven small islands. There's one island I wanna point out Fipsoya, named after British uh, sea captain. And that Fipsoya had an important uh, uh, historical note because on board one of the ships that came here uh, under Captain Phipps was a midshipman around 13 years old. You may have heard of him, Horatio Nelson, later became the hero of the, the Spanish Armada invasion, Admiral Nelson. Well, he was on the ship. And as a young man, he thought he was invincible. He heard about polar bears. He thought he'd go ashore and get a polar bear so he could bring his dad home a polar bear rug. It did not go too well for him because his gun jammed. And with the polar bear there on the nearby, uh, it shows him trying to use his gun to protect it. That's probably artistic license. Yeah. Uh, he was close enough to the ship where they were able to fire a cannon and use some musket fire and scare the polar bear away. So Horatio Nelson survived. And if he hadn't, we'd probably all be speaking Spanish today. So now we're getting to the seven islands here and we'll go to Fipsoya. And as we get there, look at what we find waiting for us. The polar bear. Yes, this is near the edge of the ice. So polar bears will come here often on their way to the ice. And sometimes we find animals here they, they can feed on on their way. Like as we come up here to this one, the island's kind of dumbbell shaped. And here we have one part of the island sticking up. Now notice it's green. You don't see a lot of green in Svalbard. Uh, not a lot of things that grow here, not a lot of plants. So to grow these plants, you need uh, like water. Well, we got water, you need some soil. You see some soil there, but also you need fertilizer. Where's your fertilizer coming from? The top of the mountain. See those white dots? And in the air, you see black dots. 
Um, those are the kittiwakes. They nest here by the thousands. And of course, when they poop, it washes down the mountain and provides fertilizer for these plants. And that's why this area is so green. So when you travel around the area and see these mounds, if you see a greenery area, we look toward the top and always find uh, birds nesting up there. Now, this picture actually does, we're not as close as it looks because I'm taking this with a telephoto lens, but still, we're pretty close, as you see here. And the polar bear's ignoring us. It's just uh, kind of uh, munching on something here. So let's take a closer look. See right there, it's feet. There's something there. The polar bear's checking us out. He's gonna show us what he's playing with. Yep, it's a kitty wake. There was a kitty wake. Not a lot of food there in, the, in there for the polar bear, so it's probably just playing with it. Uh, maybe uh, it did eat it at one time. Oh, look what we see here, rolling on the beach. It's a mother and two cubs. Polar bears do not feed in groups unless there's like a dead whale carcass on the beach, and that may attract the smell, may attract other polar bears. Polar bears are on their own. They may roam for miles and miles trying to find their food, but they don't usually hang out together. If you see a polar bear with another polar bear, maybe two polar bears like this one, you're definitely seeing a female. It's a mother and her cubs. And they're following mom around. But look at the mom. She has a collar around her neck. If you see a polar bear with a collar around its neck, even if it has no cubs with it, that is definitely a female polar bear. And that's a tracking collar to track where they go. You can't put that on male. The males have such big fat necks. If you try to put a collar on them, it slides off all the time. So only females have that collar. So we can tell we're looking at a female besides, obviously, the, the cubs there with her. And the cubs are following mom around, mimicking mom, trying to find out the area. These cubs are pretty large. They probably have another season to go before, they, they, before mom leaves them and they're off on their own. And the mom's teaching them everything they need to survive here in the Arctic. And now, of course, it's lunchtime. So mom's nursing the cubs as the cubs are taking a, a milk break. Okay, nearby, in the ice floating by, we see some walrus, and these are the females, which we did not see around Amsterdam Oya. Uh, they're all females, the one in the center, with the long tusk, that's the male. He has a harem of females there that he mates with, and those darker brown ones, the sh small ones, those, of course, are the young ones, and in the water right next to the young one, you see the female. So we're looking at, looks like a family photo here, with the mother in the water, the pup, and the dad there, sitting on the ice. A nice thing about being on the ice is that these walrus eat uh, benthic invertebrates, uh, sea cucumbers, sea stars. Their favorite food, though, are clams. And they eat about 1,000 clams a day. So by eating 1,000 clams a day with all these walrus here, they could pretty much wipe out a, a clam bed pretty quickly. But as the ice moves across the ocean, it takes them to new food sources. So that's a good way to find new food sources, just sitting on the ice and like having a food truck come over to deliver to you. That's what's happening here as they move across the ocean. And now we're gonna get into the ice. We're gonna leave Fipsoya and the Seven Islands and travel along the ice edge. And that's the place we're gonna search for polar bears looking for food. The water is very calm here because the ocean, as the ice lays on top of the water, it makes it very flat and calm. Looking out across, it gets foggy here. The ice and the cold water and uh, the warmer air makes it uh, colder. But look here, what's going on here? Yes, yeah, so if you ever see a disturbance in the water, especially a disturbance that has gulls or kittiwakes overhead, you're probably finding a whale. So let's look and see what's just under the surface of the water. And there goes a blow of a whale. In fact, you see two whales right there. Probably a mother and calf. It, um, these are called fin whales. Fin whales are the second largest of all the whales. Their skin color is quite dark. And when one unique thing about a fin whale is that on the right side of its jaw, the, it has a white coloration. And let's take a close look at it. And here they go. They're the second largest of all the whales, as Karen said, getting up to close to 80 feet long. Uh, females are slightly, uh, well, males are slightly smaller. Look at this, you're looking at the right side of the whale's jaw. Yes, and even the baleen is, is uh, white in color. As the whale comes up, you can look inside the whale's mouth. You see right at the edge, uh, the dark top of the mouth and the bottom part of the jaw, it's white. Look, at that's baleen you see. And notice the back half to the left is dark and the front half is white. It's the only whale that has that. So when we see that, we can definitely tell we're seeing a blue whale also. A fin whale. A fin whale. <laughs> of course, that large fin indicates, even without seeing the mouth, we're looking at a fin whale. 
It also has kind of a wash, a white wash on its back. It's in, in, called the chevron. It's kind of a chevron shape. So that's another indication that this is a fin whale. And that's one of the ways we can identify every single fin whale. As scientists, we take photographs of that chevron because they're different from every fin whale on the planet. And there is a fin as it goes down, so it's bigger than uh, uh, blue whale fin. And it looks like a whole family group here. It looks like on the left, we see a, a young calf with its mom and the other whale is called the escort whale. Could be the father whale heading out toward the ice in the background. And that's where we're heading, toward the ice edge. You can see the horizon, as far as we can see, it's just ice as far as it goes. And as you travel along the ice, notice something here right near the center of the picture. You can just see it barely across the ice. You can see some polar bear tracks. There are polar bears out along the ice. They like these flat expanses of ice. They can roam for miles and miles. The polar bear can smell food from over 20 miles away. So the polar bear will stick its nose in the air and just follow that trail of smell till it finds a seal. Like here, well, no seals yet. Sometimes as you look across the ice, we see dark areas. We think there are seals. Sometimes we get confused. We also may think we see a polar bear. It could be just the ice turned over because it's dirty on the bottom from algae. So it makes it hard to find uh, polar bears here. We have to really look carefully. Because it's sunlight 24 hours a day here, there could be polar bears sighted anytime. People come here mainly to see polar bears and that's what they want to see. So as expedition guides, we're under pressure to make sure people see polar bears. So when we're in these areas here, we're always on the bridge 24 hours a day looking to, for polar bears. We have a shift. We have a, we have a shift in the, in the um, a shift every day, usually two hours. Our shift that particular day was like from three o'clock until like five o'clock, just out looking for polar bears. See a seal here? There's a seal. Okay, it's resting on the nice edge, looking for uh, polar bears coming by. This seal is called a hooded seal. Very unusual. This is a female hooded seal. They uh, have an unusual characteristic. The males, when they blow their nose out, it <laughs> makes a big bubble, like a big balloon. That's to attract the females. And here is a bearded seal laying on the ice. Well, now, as we look around, that seal is very cautious because it knows, see these tracks? Polar bear tracks out in the ice looking for seals. And this polar bear's searching around trying to find a seal. This is a young polar bear. Probably its mother left it maybe this season. And it's now trained to go look for food. So that's what it's doing. They spend a lot of time in the ocean. So you see them jumping out the ice going for a swim. They can swim up to three and a half miles an hour. And after looking for around for seals, not seeing any, they take their sharp claws, dig into the ice and pull themselves out onto the ice and continue their search. It may take days before they find a seal, but to survive and stay healthy, a polar bear should eat about one seal every five days. So this polar bear goes out, here's a female out in the ice. She has her nose in the air looking for that smell, trying to find that smell. And she'll follow it for days until she finds this, like this polar bear found. Here's a seal, a formerly sleeping bearded seal laying on the ice. And the polar bear is eating it. It uses its sharp claws to open up the seal like a knife and fork and pulls out the blubber. That's the only part the polar bear will eat is the blubber. And it needs to get that big layer of blubber, a uh, big chunk of blubber like it's pulling out here so it can get nice and plump, especially to survive in the winter time. So that polar bear will eat as much as it can. And after a big meal, it'll lay down on the ice and take a nap. So now we're gonna leave the polar bear and take its nap. We're gonna leave the Arctic, return to North America and tell other people about these incredible animals, which in Norway, they call the ice bears that we call the polar bears. Well, um, we do have one question that's in the chat right now that I will just okay. run by you. Okay. Um, someone would like to know, they're, ask, they're actually asking about the shift, the expedition yeah. that you mentioned early on. And they were asking if the expedition is part of, and I, I hope I say this word correctly, Hertigruden? Um, actually, that ship is not part of Hertigruden. Hi. And I oh. think, can you see me now? Yeah, now I see you. <laughs> okay, Wayne fixed it. Um, Hertigruten is the, is the company that we work for now. But uh, at the time, most of those pictures were taken. We worked for a company called G Adventures. And okay. they have one ship. 
and it's called um, the expedition. But we really, um, we, we, um, lately we've been to Antarctica and the Arctic with Hurtigruten. And uh, last summer we were actually in Svalbard, but just a short time. Most of our time last summer was spent in uh, Greenland. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw polar bears, of course, there. And also in Greenland, we saw the first time ever, I've always wanted to see them, we saw the narwhals for the first time. You know, the, uh, the uh, whale with the big tooth sticking out of its head? Whale. Unicorn <laughs> whale. So in Greenland, that's a good place to see them. Uh, let's, we have a question from someone who wants to know, do you carry bear, bear spray or is it not considered effective against polar bears? It's not considered effective against polar bears. So we don't carry bear spray. Gotcha. Okay. We carry a flare pistol and binoculars and of course our, our rifle. And then leave. Yeah, right. We've actually had to do that. One time we're on the uh, west side of, uh, excuse me, the east side uh, of Svalbard and we got people ashore. I was actually driving a Zodiac, taking people ashore. We got about half our group ashore, about 50 people. And one of our, our scouts saw a mother and cubs heading toward us from about a mile away. So we just took everybody off the shore back to the ship and left. So okay. the best, time to see, best way to see them, like you saw in our photographs, see them from the ocean. So we have control and we can leave if the, if the polar bear starts to approach us. So that's the uh, safest way to have you ever had a trip oh, where you just didn't find polar bears and you had some like disappointed <laughs> passengers? Unfortunately, yes. That's ha that happened once. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, actually, the first time it happened, actually happened to us, we were on our first trip ever uh, about three years ago. And uh, we were on a, we had our shift from like four o'clock until six o'clock. Because the team takes turns um, being on watch. Okay. And at three o'clock in the morning, there was a call on the ship uh, intercom saying, oh, polar bear spotted, polar bear spotted. We thought, we, we can get one more hour and the polar bear will still be there. Well, it turned out, not only was the polar bear not there, it was the best sighting of the whole season. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so every you time it. you always uh, go to sleep with your clothes by your bedside, you can jump out of the bed in your clothes and hop out on deck to mm -hmm. see the polar bears. Because it's light out all the time. So it's right. not like it's dark, so. Now, when you go there to see the polar bears, um, I've only been skunked once as far as not seeing a polar bear. It was a short trip, only a week trip. You want to do at least a two-week trip yeah. to make sure you see them. Well, one of the trips we were there, we saw as many as 17 polar bears, which is the <laughs> largest number I've seen on a trip. Other times you may see one or two. Unfortunately, sometimes you may see like a polar bear in the distance. Look at binoculars, you can see it, but uh, it's kind of hard to take a picture of it unless you have a really long lens. So right. we always see polar bears, but sometimes not as close as some of the images you saw in our program today. Let's see, we have a couple questions. One wants to know, what's the lifespan of a seal? Depends on the seal. Depends on the seal. Usually about anywhere from 25 to 30 years, about average for seals. Yeah, okay. Polar bears live about uh, 35 years, but in captivity, they live longer because they're uh, well taken care of, they're well cared for. And if their teeth wear down, they slow down, they're still being fed. Um, someone has a question here. They want to know, do bears cover their black nose with their paws so they can hunt without being seen by their prey? I have read that a long time ago. Oh yeah, that's um, kind of one of those myths. Think about it. If a, a polar bear is walking, doesn't he need four legs to walk? So how can he like cover up his nose? And also polar bears, I mean, they can see themselves in the water, but they don't think they're conscious of that. So that is a yeah. myth and it's not, not true. They actually debunk that. All right, well, I think we got our questions answered. Um, thank you so much for taking us on this trip with you. Sure, <laughs> thanks can, for joining how us. How can people ask more questions? Oh yeah, if you wanna ask more questions, you can do this. You can actually go and uh, go to our website. Oops, our website is uh, a place you can actually contact us, email us, and they're always happy to email you back, answer to your questions. Yeah, okay. theoceanadventure.com. Happy to, happy to write to um, answer questions, yes. Okay. Wayne and Karen, thank you so much for a great program. We really appreciate it. Oh, it was Thanks fun. For Thanks for having us, Roz. Okay. Bye, everybody.